This week in IT, Google asked the US government to break apart Microsoft's exclusive deal with OpenAI. Organizations are struggling with the storage requirements for AI. And I've got some Windows news for enterprises and Copilot Plus PCs. So stay tuned for all the latest news. Welcome to This Week in IT, the show where I talk about everything connected to Windows, Azure and Microsoft 365. Before I get started today, I've got a quick favour to ask you. About 78% of the people who watched last video weren't subscribed to the channel. Now, as we go live today, we're on about 10,640 subscribers, so I'd love if we could push that up to 10,700 this week. So if you'd like to see these weekly news updates from Petri.com, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure that you don't miss out on the latest uploads. The US Federal Trade Commission has been investigating Microsoft's business dealings and as part of that investigation Google has asked the US government to break up Microsoft's exclusive contract that it has with OpenAI. Now that contract involves Microsoft providing all the compute power that OpenAI needs to run its services and to develop new learning language models and you can imagine that's a massive requirement and in return Microsoft Microsoft gets access to OpenAI services and intellectual property. Now, as part of this, Google is also saying that customers who purchase OpenAI services via Microsoft are also potentially paying more. Now, if this request gets granted, this potentially means that AWS and Google Cloud Platform could also end up hosting some of OpenAI services. Now, I do wonder whether Google Cloud Platform has the capacity to really handle its own services that it offers, Gemini and OpenAI as well, because I know that Microsoft seems to be struggling because OpenAI have been complaining a little bit recently that it doesn't have the compute power that it really needs to move forwards and develop things at the speed that it would like. But OpenAI has raised the funding that it needs to get that extra compute power. I guess the question now is just where it's going to get that compute power from Microsoft or could this potentially open up to a wider set of providers. There's also been a lot of talk this week about artificial general intelligence. This is a level of AI where we get to the point that artificial intelligence is essentially able to teach itself without us having to do it. Now, OpenAI is saying that we could reach this point in 2025 with current hardware. It's interesting that Microsoft is saying that's actually not possible and that we won't be able to achieve that. So we'll see how that actually works out. But there's also a point in the contract that Microsoft and OpenAI have together that essentially says that that partnership will become void upon achieving artificial general intelligence. So they're trying to change that to secure future funding and investment. Now, I'm not sure it's fair to say that OpenAI has a monopoly on artificial intelligence. I would guess that it's by far the biggest player in this area, especially if you consider that everything that Microsoft does with AI, or at least almost everything connected to Microsoft 365 Copilot, for instance, is essentially OpenAI providing all of those language models and technologies technology to make all of that stuff happen. So I guess the question is, you know, does the Federal Trade Commission consider that OpenAI has a monopoly and that they should be sharing the rewards of that essentially across a series of different cloud providers? So I guess we'll have to wait and see how that ruling pans out. And I guess that's not going to be something that's quick. I think we're going to have to wait until next year or maybe even the year after to finally you know, see See how that all pans out because these things don't happen quickly. It's interesting there's lots of stuff happening in this space of course not just with AI but in terms of all these legal things that there's now a potentially some movement towards forcing Google to sell off its Chrome browser. Now how that would work I don't know because okay who could actually afford to buy the browser from Google even if they were forced to sell it. 
Microsoft, Amazon, does that just not put it in the hands of another huge corporation and not really change anything? But maybe Google, of course, is pushing for this as they potentially see part of their huge corporate set of offerings and consumer offerings could potentially be broken apart. Let me know in the comments below what you think about Google's request to break up Microsoft's agreement with OpenAI. Do you think it's fair that OpenAI should just be able to choose who they partner with in terms of compute resources? Or do you think they should be sharing the love with AWS, Google and others? I'd love to know what you think. According to a new study by Hitachi Vantara, corporations could see the need for a 150% increase in storage by 2026 because of artificial intelligence. So you might ask, well, what on earth has artificial intelligence got to do with increased storage capacity? So the problem lies here that in order to train these models and to get great answers from them that we can actually trust, organizations are having to keep more and more data. Now, of course, there are reasons why data has to be kept you know, as it stands, even without artificial intelligence, because of various regulatory compliance and legal holds and all of that kind of thing. But essentially, organizations are now saying, well, if we really want to trust the answers that we get from artificial intelligence, we're going to need to store data for much longer periods of time than we have done in the past, so that we can be sure that artificial intelligence actually provides us with a good return on investment, i.e. it's something that we can actually use with confidence. So apparently organizations are set to double their storage budgets going into 2025, 2026. So there's going to be a big surge in the requirements for storage. Great if you're involved in that business. Microsoft announced this week that it's planning to automatically migrate enterprise users to the new version of Outlook by April 2026. So you're getting a lot of warning and lead time with this one. Now, if you've used the new Outlook, you know that it doesn't quite live up to the legacy client. There are various power user features are missing, for instance. The add-ins are more limited because of the model that it uses. And Microsoft is gradually adding features into the new client, but for basic use, it's kind of okay. I'm using it from day to day. I don't have any particular need for some of the power features that might be missing from the legacy client. But of course, a lot of enterprise users do. Now, there will be the option to stop this auto-migrate from happening. Happening. So there will be a policy that administrators, administrators can set to make sure that users aren't auto, automatically migrated over to the new version of Outlook. So that's the first thing. There will also be some other exclusions from this policy. So if you have an on-premises account, so essentially if you're not in Microsoft 365, then you don't have to worry about this. If you have perpetual licenses or those opted out via the admin controls, that I've just mentioned, you're not going to be automatically up, upgraded to, or, or, I shouldn't say upgraded because it's not an upgrade, automatically migrated to the new version of Outlook. So in those cases, you don't need to worry. Now, Microsoft is saying that they're going to support the legacy version of Outlook until at least 20 29. So it's only really until after that point, you've got to potentially worry about what you're going to do in terms of getting the rest of your users off that legacy client. Windows recall back in the news this week. So this was originally supposed to be a feature exclusive to the Snapdragon Qualcomm chips when they launched back in the summer. Of course, Microsoft really messed this up. They didn't really anticipate the the mood around this feature. I think they thought this was going to be the big selling point and the people would rush to get these new PCs because of this kind of must have feature. But that's not what happened. The exact, the exact opposite happened, really. People were really very concerned about the privacy and security issues surrounding this. So Microsoft had to withdraw it, essentially. They went back to the table. They re-released it to Windows Insiders a few weeks ago, but only for those on these uh, um, Qualcomm chips essentially saying that support for Intel and AMD Copilot Plus PCs only at this stage, of course, would come later. That 
later has now come and in the latest win Windows Insider preview this feature is now available for Intel and AMD chips if you're running a Copilot Plus PC as well. Now I'm not going to go into the depth about all this uh, Windows recall stuff. There are plenty of videos where we've talked about it on this channel before but apparently we're expecting to see this become generally available now in early 2025. Microsoft has got a nice little Christmas present for Exchange Server Administrators. So what is due to be the last cumulative update for Exchange Server 2019 has now been delayed until January 2025. So you don't have to worry about getting that update installed before the holidays. Of course, this is always a very busy period. It's difficult to get changes approved happening through December. So you've got a little bit of a respite from the necessity to apply that update. Now, if you weren't already aware, Exchange Server 2019 is set to reach end of life essentially in October 2025. This cumulative update is the last one of those that's going to be made widely available for this version of Exchange Server. And Microsoft is essentially saying that if you're not already on Exchange Server 2019, they're advising you to upgrade from whatever version you're currently running and then the next version of Exchange Server which is going to be called Exchange Server Subscription Edition Yep, the clue is in the name there. This is something that you, they're just saying, well, you do an in-place upgrade. Once you've got to Exchange Server 2019, you can just do an in-place uh, upgrade to Exchange Server Subscription Edition. At least that's what they're recommending to do. I know a lot of administrators still think that that's, you know, a big no-no in a production environment. But Microsoft is essentially deeming it as a supported upgrade path even for production servers. So I guess you just have to try that out uh, for yourself and see you know, if it's a reliable upgrade path or not. If you found this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up because that helps us to get the video seen by more people on YouTube and to grow the channel. I'm gonna leave another video on the screen for you now about an announcement Microsoft made last week about Windows 11 hardware requirements. So do check that out. But that's it for me this week and I'll see you next time.